do uh, as practice for some of the concepts that you're learning. And then on um, Friday, we have another exercise session that will be devoted to an exam, which will cover um, uh, a couple key topics from each lecture, um, or each, each lecturer that we you know, will kind of uh, examine you on. Um, Yeah, you have to return the money if you don't pass. Uh, give it to me. <laughs> no, uh, so yeah, just to test your knowledge, and then there is an opportunity, which was uh, advertised uh, through some support uh, next year uh, for UC Berkeley uh, through one of the organizers who unfortunately couldn't make it this week uh, due to travel issues. So, um, yeah, for more details, we can talk offline about it. But that's the general plan for the exercise sessions and the exams. Um, so then. I think that's it for announcements. Uh, so now, uh, Dr. Andre Walker Loud is going to give us uh, some lectures on um, effective field theories. Uh, take it away, Andre. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is loud. I'll try not to talk too loud. Good morning, everybody. Um, the glasses, my glasses, seem incompatible with the thing, but that's okay because I need glasses to see far, close is fine. So this is a product of physics because my do eye doctor said, because I look at a computer too much, my eye, my vision's bad. So I can't see you, you're a little blurry, and maybe that's okay. So, okay, uh, yes, let me start also with, my name is Andre. I'm perfectly happy if you could just call me Andre. Doctor is very unnecessary. And then I have these two last names because uh, I was born in the 70s. And if you know anything about that, that was the time of hippies in at least the United States. And so I have my mom's name and my dad's name. And they tried to save me some grief as a kid because, you know, usually you put your dad's name first. So instead of Loud Walker, they thought, oh, they'll call me Walker Loud. And in school, everybody called me Loud Walker anyway, so... And then, close to that, similarly, if you have questions, I'd be, I, will, I might have a longer delay than a month, and feel free to send emails more often, but just walk loud at lbl.gov. That's because I work at a government lab, gov. All right, so how many of you are familiar with quantum field theory? And how many of you are not familiar with quantum field theory? How about that? Meaning, how many of you, if I said, let's do a loop integral, would be like, ah. Everybody's happy? OK, a couple of people aren't happy. Maybe more aren't happy than are expressing their unhappiness. Um, so OK, so effective field theory is quantum field theory at a more advanced level. And one of my goals is to help give you uh, some practical guide to actually doing calculations in effective field theory means I might move a little fast, and I won't spend much time pontificating on the deep meaning of quantum field theory. My approach to quantum field theory is Lagrangian diagrams answers, and that's how I get my understanding of quantum field theory. I'll try to give you some of that. Um, so what is an effective field theory? How many of you are familiar with what effective field theory means? Anyone? Okay. Also, please ask lots of questions, as many as you're, even ones you're uncomfortable with, you know, go ahead and ask. It makes it much more enjoyable when you're giving a talk or a lecture when people ask questions. And also, as people will say, most likely, if you have a question, there's a few other people in the room with the same question. They're just more embarrassed than you to ask. So someone has to take the, the lead and ask the first question. And, uh, some people will say there's no such thing as a dumb question. I have a different philosophy. I think there's lots of dumb questions, but we should feel comfortable asking dumb questions. It's okay to ask a dumb question, because oftentimes you hear the answer, and that's when you're like, oh, that was a dumb question. Of course, I just needed to think about it for a second, but that's fine. I don't know if many of you have this experience. Oftentimes, I would have a question, and I'd work myself up for days, and then I'd eventually go and ask my advisor the question. And the minute I was asking it out loud, I was like, oh, that's the answer. So sometimes you just need to talk to yourself also to get to the answer. 
We just okay. Here we go. So what is an effective field theory? So first, EFT for short. Lots of acronyms. This is effective field theory. The field, of course, is implying quantum field in theory. Okay, it is our modern uh, implementation of quantum field theory uh, for describing all sorts of observed phenomena. So things ranging from particle physics, nuclear physics, What else? Uh, condensed matter physics. Uh, quantum gravity. So I don't know if you know about that, but people use effective field theory to describe quantum gravity. I'll we'll just call it quantum GR. Uh, beyond the standard model physics, I'll use BSM for short, for beyond the standard model, SM for standard model, many other things. Okay. And what is this really? Effective field theory, I wanna, one of the things I want you to get away from this is it's a rigorous mathematical framework that encodes things that you find intuitive, in fact, when you describe the world. And let me describe what, say what I mean by that. So, for example, should the mass of the nucleon depend upon the dynamics of the bottom quark? What do you think? Anyone? Should the mass of the nucleon depend upon the dynamics of the bottom quark? Why? Because the bottom quark is really heavy. It's hard for it to do much. Notice I didn't say should it depend on the mass of the bottom quark, and maybe we'll get to answering that difference between when I say should it depend on the mass of the bottom quark versus the dynamics of the bottom quark. So. There's an interesting way in which the nuclear mass can depend on the mass of the bottom quark. But it shouldn't depend upon the dynamics. There's a separation of scales. It's so heavy, it's, it's effectively irrelevant to the physics we're interested in. And this word irrelevant is going to be used sometimes loosely and sometimes rigorously in a quantum field theory sense. How many of you remember what an irrelevant operator is in quantum field theory? So you're all blurry to me, so I can't tell if you're looking at me in confusion or boredom. And also I've learned the look of confusion and boredom is the same. Uh, and this is a fun story I can tell you about giving a lecture in quantum mechanics to some students where I mistook boredom, for, no, I mistook confusion for boredom. So I was talking way too fast. Okay. Uh, what was my question? Why, uh, I was talking about the separation of scales. I, I, I forgot where I was, you guys. Irrelevant operators. Irrelevant operators, right. So how many of you know the mass of every operator in Lagrangian has to be equal to four? The mass dimension of every operator has to be, okay, if, when I say mass dimension, how many of you, is anyone unfamiliar with when I say the mass dimension of an operator? Okay. Mass dimension of an operator. So here's a Lagrangian. I'm just going to write down a non-interacting theory. I have a fermion, I have a kinetic operator, and then another fermion. So why does this have to have mass? Well, first, what is mass dimension? So we know we have something we call the action. It's the integral of the Lagrangian density, right? The mass dimension of the action is zero. It's a dimensionless number. The mass dimension of d4x, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> so many things I've forgotten. We're working in the only units that make sense for doing analytic calculations. So what's the mass dimension of d4x? 
Right, minus 4. I had the minus 9 there already. So that means the mass dimension of Lagrangian has to be 4. Perfect. Okay. So if I look at this, what's the mass dimension of a kinetic uh, operator? D, d slash. It has one unit of energy. So what is the mass dimension of the fermion? I can't hear very well either because three halves, right, okay. So that's when I say the mass dimension of an operator has to, so every operator in Lagrangian has to have a mass dimension four. And then, of course we interchange the Lagrangian and Lagrange density all the time. I will do the same. So. That doesn't mean, so in this case, the mass dimension of the operator is four, but if I added a mass term, sometimes people will say, ah, the operator is just psi bar psi and m is the coefficient. So in this case, the mass dimension of psi bar psi is three and the coefficient has dimension one. This is called a relevant operator in quantum field theory. So if and then if we have, uh, well, here, I already used fermions. I was going to write down a phi to the four interaction. And I was like, uh-oh, there's no bosons in this theory. So let's put down some four fermion operator. So what's the mass dimension of G? Minus two. It's negative. So whenever you have a coefficient with a negative mass dimension, that is an irrelevant operator. And what that means, this language irrelevant, relevant, and this is a marginal operator, is as you probe the theory at longer and longer wavelengths or shorter and sh smaller and smaller energy, the irrelevant operators become less and less important. And that's one of the concepts of effective field theory we're going to talk about. <clears throat> okay. So in the same vein, should the spectrum of hydrogen depend upon the nucleon mass? Does the electron care what the nucleon mass is when it's bound to a hydrogen atom? Anybody remember? Not very much. I mean, both your memory and the fact that it doesn't depend much on the mass of the nucleon. Yes, so the nucleon is really heavy, so the spectrum of hydrogen doesn't really depend on the nucleon mass to first approximation. And so what the effective field theory gives us, in fact, is a framework with which in quantum field theory to encode how to add small corrections such as the effect of the nuclear mass on hydrogen. You probably wouldn't use quantum field theory to do that. You can do just as good in quantum mechanics, but it's the same idea. So this effective field theory language is just a way to incorporate this intuition that things at very high energy, things that are very massive, should not affect our daily life. You shouldn't your daily life does not depend on the fact that the top quark mass is 173 GeV for the most part, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> effective field theories, they work when you have a separation of scales. Most often, this separation of scales is encoded as an uh, energy scale. So you might have a, some high energy scale, which we might call lambda UV for ultraviolet or high energy. Sometimes we'll just refer to it as lambda. This is some high energy scale. And then you'll also have some uh, low energy scales. So you'll have some dynamics at some energy scale. Here I'll just use P for momentum or energy, which is much, much less than lambda. And this is where effective field theories work, because what it does is it lets you then form a small parameter, P over lambda, with which you can do perturbation theory. And so then the whole idea is if you have uh, some physical process you want to know to a given precision, 
what you do is you have to just figure out, based on how big your expansion parameter is, how many orders in epsilon do you have to work to achieve the desired precision? So what's an important rule of an effective field theory? Uh, anything not forbidden is compulsory. So if there's some process or some operator you can write down that is not prohibited by the symmetries of the theory, you have to add it. So this, Weinberg has some great papers on effective field theory. I think this is a quote of one of his papers, but I don't actually remember strictly if it's his quote, someone else's, and if it is his quote, which paper it's from. Um, so if you have to write down everything possible, and so now we're going to do effective field theory. Here I've already written down an operator that has mass dimension greater than four. And maybe you remember from quantum field theory that, oh, wait, don't you only want operators of mass dimension four or less? Otherwise, you don't have a renormalizable theory. Yes, effective field theories are non-renormalizable. But that's okay. Because we have this small expansion parameter, we'll, which will let us uh, decide how many powers in, so here this, has, this G has mass dimension minus two, which means G is probably scaling like one over lambda squared. So how many powers in inverse lambda do we have to go to for the physics we're interested in? So effective field theories are, they typically have an infinite set of operators. And here I'll write down my first Lagrangian. I'll probably write down lots of Lagrangians. So here I'm just going to be very generic. I'm going to say I have some Lagrangian of mass dimension four. So all operators, in, uh, you know, here I'll call this mass dimension four, this one as well. And then you get plus a sum of an infinite tower of operators. And maybe I should call this four plus n. So we have some coefficients. We have operators of mass dimension four plus n. Coefficients of those operators, we'll call them c four, in this particular case, four plus n. And they're suppressed by some ultraviolet scale to the power n. So in order to be effective, this effective field theory must have a small parameter which lets you ignore most of these operators. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty ineffective because you're going to have too many parameters you have to include. And typically, in an effective field theory, you don't know what these coefficients are ahead of time. And so you either have to figure that out by, if you know the exact high energy theory, you can actually calculate what they are. Or Sometimes you have the exact high energy theory like QCD and it's non-perturbative and so you, there's no way you can actually calculate these operators on pen and paper. You either have to infer them by comparing with experimental data or with lattice QCD. Uh, so what's going to happen because of this is these operators, it's hidden inside this Lagrangian here, but you're going to see that they will effectively scale with powers of epsilon. And so this, we're going to introduce the concept of power counting, which you're probably also familiar with, even if you don't know by those words. We're going to power count to certain orders in epsilon to figure out what we need to do. <clears throat> well, I forgot to turn on my timer, meaning I can't see the clock. So I think it looks like it's 5 after 30. So I've been talking for 20 minutes already. So like Sebastian, I'm like, oh, well, at least I got the th board 3 by the 20th minute. <laughs> okay. So, so just to say something concrete, if we want to know some process to 1% and epsilon is 0 0.1, then this tells us we have to work to order epsilon squared in order to reach that precision. So this is, again, effective field theory is a very intuitive concept. I'm saying stuff I think you just are going to automatically understand here. Okay. Another thing to note is the effective field theory, built into it, it tells us the breakdown scale.
What do I mean by that? So if we're wanting to describe some physical system at some energy P, if we go to an energy P that approaches the cutoff of the theory, this small parameter is not going to be small anymore. And so that's telling you the theory has a range of validity, and it's not go it has to be less than lambda. So you, this theory already has a cutoff built in. It's not going to describe things above a certain energy scale. And that's nice. It means you know the limited range where this theory will apply. <clears throat> uh, other things to know, you may have more than one small parameter. So epsilon, epsilon prime, different ways of de defining small parameters. Um, it doesn't, epsilon doesn't have to come from energy scales. Epsilon It could be a velocity, say. Or some other way to define a small parameter in the theory. Again, what it does is it lets us do perturbation theory in epsilon. So we're using quantum field theory. And even when we apply it to a non-perturbative system like QCD, we get to do perturbation theory. Um, also, the degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom, uh, in the EFT need not be and are often not the same as in the ultraviolet theory. So when I say ultraviolet theory, do you guys have a feeling what I mean? So in a very specific example of QCD, the fundamental degrees of freedom are quarks and gluons. But when we construct the low energy theory of QCD, the degrees of freedom are pions, kaons, and nucleons. So they're different degrees of freedom. And so very often the degrees of and even so there's, a, there's other examples like soft collinear effective theory, where you have gluons in QCD, and you have gluons in soft collinear effective theory, but they're not the same gluons. You actually have to separate them into different you know, you have to count them as different degrees of freedom. And if you do what's called Wilsonian renormalization, really you're just running the momentum down. And so you have some degree of freedom that may have the same symbol in your high energy and low energy theory, but they mean different things, so just like this gluon and soft collinear effective theory. Other interesting things is the EFT will have a... a Okay, we'll have the same or more symmetry than the ultraviolet theory. That's an interesting concept. So the EFT has to respect all the symmetries of the ultraviolet theory. That hopefully is intuitive why. You're trying to use a low energy description of an uh, a ultraviolet theory if the ultraviolet theory has some symmetry, the low energy theory better respect that same symmetry. But when you go to low energy, you might have more symmetry that accidentally emerges that did not exist in the high energy theory. And so one thing we'll talk about later, imagine you have lattice QCD. So how many of you are familiar with lattice QCD, at least at a very superficial level? Take QCD, discretize it, on a hypercubic grid. So the hypercubic lattice does not have Lorentz symmetry. Right? It only has discrete rotational symmetry. It doesn't have a continuous rotational symmetry. But as you study lattice QCD of low energy, Lorentz symmetry just emerges, meaning you don't have to somehow bake it in. Like if you didn't even think that you lost Lorentz symmetry in the lattice and you start taking your lattice facing smaller and smaller, you will accidentally recover Lorentz symmetry without even having to put it in by hand. So this is also a, a nice idea when you're trying to construct how to do lattice QCD for supersymmetry, for example. Maybe the lattice doesn't have supersymmetry, but it accidentally does at low energy. All right. <clears throat> so we now actually, in our modern description of the nature, 
we believe most likely the standard model is a low energy effective theory of some more complete theory. Now it's interesting because the standard model is constructed from mass dimension four operators and it is therefore uh, just renormalizable. We don't need effective field theory for the standard model. So what happens when you have a non-renormalizable theory? How many of you remember? If you put in some physics and you can regulate all the infinities with operators that look exactly like the ones you started with, you have a renormalizable theory. When you have operators with mass dimension uh, greater than four, like this case, you will introduce singularities that you have to regulate for which you must introduce new operators of even higher mass dimension. That's typically what happens when you have a non-renormalizable theory. So the standard models are normalizable. We don't actually need to add more operators. But we also know it doesn't seem to describe the world we live in. So we need to in encode new physics. <clears throat> also, where does effective field theory not work for BSM physics? something like a dark photon, a light degree of freedom. So in order for effective field theory to work, like treating the standard model as an effective field theory of new physics, that new physics must be heavier than all the degrees of freedom in the standard model. Otherwise, like in the case of a dark photon, if you try to describe that with an effective field theory, you'd have to introduce a non-local Lagrangian because this photon can propagate from X to Y on energy scales you're interested in. Whereas the idea of effective field theory is you're taking high energy physics and you're integrating it out, which means it will collapse down to what looks like a local interaction between the remaining degrees of freedom you want to keep talking about. And I'll put these words into some more context uh, as we go on. I'm just seeing how much of this I've already said. Okay. Let's use this concept of the standard model as an effective field theory, just one simple example. And we can ask, what is the set of dimension five operators we can add beyond the standard model? That are, so what we want is we want to um, construct operators with only standard model degrees of freedom because we've integrated out all the other physics. So the only thing left over is standard model degrees of freedom. And if we're constructing operators with standard model degrees of freedom, it means it has to obey all the symmetries of the standard model. And then you say, what, what is the set of operators you can write down at mass dimension five? And it's pretty interesting, there's only one operator at mass dimension five. Does anybody know what it is? So if you look at the mass dimension five operator, what you get here is some coefficient lambda ij. This is a dimensionless coefficient suppressed by some ultraviolet scale. And then you have a left-handed fermion, a left-handed, not just fermion, but in fact a lepton. The Higgs field and then we add the Hermitian conjugate to make sure we have a good operator. <clears throat> now, this, again, these left-handed uh, leptons, these are, for example, uh, the uh, neutrino of the electron and the electron neutrino, the neutrino of the muon, or the muon, and the tau. And H is the Higgs field. We know the Higgs uh, has a vacuum expectation value, so we can write the Higgs field as um, uh, the vacuum expectation value zero plus some small quantum fluctuation field, well, some quantum fluctuation fields. But if we're at very low energy, the excitation of the Higgs is sort of irrelevant. It's too heavy to, the dynamics of the Higgs don't matter. But then if you look at this Lagrangian, what you see is you get the, the Higgs talking to the neutrino in such a way that you get two neutrinos 
And so this becomes, at low energy, something that looks like um, Uh, this is supposed to be a neutrino. Neutrino I, neutrino J. So if you just consider, for example, let lambda be diagonal in flavor, lepton flavor, this is a Majorana neutrino mass. So it's got, it doesn't have nu bar nu, it has nu nu. So it's a Majorana neutrino mass. So the only operator at dimension five you can write down in an effective field theory where the standard model is a Majorana neutrino mass. And so this is one of the very, this is one of the reasons many people feel compelled to believe very likely the Majorana or the neutrino might be Majorana in nature. Because from an effective field theory perspective, this is the most natural extension of the standard model. Now what do I mean by natural? Well, what I mean is if this scale lambda is very large, then presumably the operators at the next dimension six, which have one over lambda squared, will be even more suppressed. So they'll be less relevant to the world we see. And so the most natural, meaning the most likely thing that we might observe is this neutrino mass. So if we take the assumption that this dimension five operator is the only thing that contributes to the neutrino mass, meaning everything else is irrelevant. So that's just the first thing we can try to do. And we ask, what is the scale we expect lambda to be if that is the case? <clears throat> so the vacuum expectation value, this is a number of 250 GeV. We know the neutrino mass is less than about, say, one electron volt. The constraints might be even tighter, but let me just put in this number for now. So then, if these uh, lambda parameters are order one, so another thing you should pay attention to with effective field theories is if you've done a good job building the effective field theory, then all the coefficients should be order one. They shouldn't be order 10 or 0.1 or 100 or 0.001. If the numbers are very different from one, it means you've probably messed up how you've included the physics you're missing. Why? Um, I'm just thinking of a good way to answer the question, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I guess what it means is, so these coefficients will be accompanied by these small parameters epsilon to some power. And if you believe that parameter epsilon is doing a good job parameterizing the physics, so if, you're, if you think of just some generic function of x, if, you, if your function is describing the physics you're observing well, then you expect, like if your slope is 10, maybe that means uh, you have made your parameter epsilon too small, right? So what you've done is you've set the ultraviolet scale too high, and so it's saying, oh, you made that too big, so we find this unnaturally large. Co okay, I guess it's also a statement in expectations of uh, Taylor expansions. Like if you construct a Taylor expansion of some function and the coefficients of your Taylor expansion are order one, it means you expect a convergent expansion. And if the coefficients are large, either you have a non-converging expansion because your coefficients are too big, or you've goofed up in how you've parameterized the small parameter describing the perturbations. Um, I wish I had a more quantitative answer for you. I think it, at the moment it's sort of stuck at this intuitive level. Yeah, it could be that you have constructed everything well, your parameter epsilon is well defined, and somehow the dynamics of the theory just produces a larger coefficient for you. And that's just, that, that's out of your control. But what you'd, I guess you'd like to assess out is, 
Is it the dynamics of the theory that are leading to a large coefficient, or is it that you screwed up your expectation of how small the parameter should be, or how, you know, how big lambda should be? And it's, maybe there's not an a absolute quantitative way to do that. But a, a rule of thumb, at least, is you should expect your coefficients to be order one if you've constructed the theory well. So then if we stick these numbers in, you know, I have V squared over lambda, I want this to be on the order of one electron volt, and V is 250 GV, or we can think about it as a quarter times 10 to the 12, right? And then in order to get this constraint, what you're led to is lambda is uh, greater than about 10 to the 23 electron volts, which is, well, that's the same as, I'll just say here, greater than 10 to the 14 GeV, which is very close to the gut scale where people thought maybe QCD would combine with electroweak theory. This is a very high energy scale. And if that's the case, what's interesting is, A, that means you're never going to see this physics in a collider that we build on Earth. It's way too high energy. But what the effective field theory allows you to do is sort of look for signatures of beyond the standard model physics in low energy environments and still make rigorous statements about the scale of that new physics. And so low energy precision studies of the standard model are actually complementary to and sometimes competitive with constraints you get from collider experiments on looking for new physics. The challenge is you don't get to directly see the new physics. What you're trying to do is infer how that new physics impacts the world around us through the little quantum fluctuations of that new physics. Okay, so if you know the ultraviolet theory, then we can uh, compute these coefficients lambda from the UV theory by what's called matching S matrix elements. What does this mean? It means you just find some observable you're interested in, some scattering amplitude, some mass, or something, and you just require, at the order you're working in the effective theory, that the quantity you compute in the effective field theory and in the complete theory are the same, up to higher order corrections. That's matching. Um, it can also mean, in a more um, rigorous sense, you take the partition function defined in the ultraviolet theory and the low energy theory, and you require the correlation functions you compute in these two different theories to be the same. So it's not necessarily an observable, but it has to be a correlation function that contains observables in it. Now, if you know the UV theory, uh, <clears throat> if we know the UV theory, importantly, and it is perturbative, meaning we can apply our perturbation theory techniques as we can do this. Like if we don't, for example, QCD is an example where we know the theory, but we can't compute anything on pen and paper and low energy, so we, we can't use matching that way. We have to resort to using lattice QCD to do the matching, where we have a non-perturbative solution to the theory. Okay, so this is, this is a concept of the standard model as an effective theory. What about some other ideas? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, perfect, yes. So. I forgot to emphasize that, but because 
So can you repeat just for the, 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 the comment, yeah, the comment is effective filters are systematically improvable, which means, so what does that mean? Coming back to the statement I made before, if everything that is um, not strictly forbidden is compulsory, that means you're including all physics. There's nothing you're neglecting. And then, if you include every single possible thing that can happen, so you're not neglecting anything, and you have a method of organizing the relative importance of all that physics, you can keep improving the theory to whatever desired accuracy you want in principle. The one caveat being, all effective field theories are asymptotic expansions. So at some point, it's going to break down and you will lose control of being able to predict things, both because uh, you can't constrain all the coefficients of your EFT, but also because the number of them explodes. So chiral perturbation theory, one example. At leading order, you have two parameters. At next to leading order, you have four if you're in two flavor, and you have 10 if you're in three flavor. And then you go to N to a low, and then you have over 100 parameters. So being able to constrain all the parameters is very challenging. In the standard model, you have one, well, depending how you count it, you know, you have three or nine parameters at the mass dimension five, and you go to the next order, and I think there's 6,000. You know, so it's fairly hopeless. But then you have to say, well, let me restrict myself to only looking at CP violation or only looking at parity violation, and you can vastly reduce the number. But the, the main point is it's, because you're including all physics, it's systematically improvable because you work to a specified precision, which is, tells you the order and epsilon, the small parameter you need to work in. And at that precision, you haven't neglected any physics, assuming the effective field theory is the correct description of the phenomena you're interested in. I think that's a longer-winded way of saying what the comment was. <laughs> Okay, so what are other examples of effective field theories? So I think the most well-known example is Fermi's theory of weak interactions. So when Fermi constructed the theory, of course, he didn't know he was doing effective field theory, but he was. He was doing leading order effective field theory. Um, so what did Fermi observe? He observed that he could describe weak decays by introducing a four fermion operator. For example, uh, there's some coefficient, CW. Here I'll put in a proton. The, he didn't use this particular form at the time, but now we know it's vector minus axial neutron, and then electron. I guess I need, so I work in Euclidean space all the time where upper and lower indices don't mean anything. <clears throat> and this coupling was unknown, but when he compared it to experimental data, he found this coupling was on the order of inverse 100 GeV squared. So it's mass dimension minus two, so it's an irrelevant operator. Um, so this is what you would call a bottom-up approach to applying effective field theory, where you don't know the ultraviolet theory, but you have some observations, and you can write down a Lagrangian that describes that physics, and then you just match the coefficient to experimental constraints. We also know this theory cannot be correct at high energy because it predicts cross-sections that grow with energy. And so eventually they'll violate unitarity bounds. Fifteen, yeah. <clears throat> so 
So when I say, uh, whatever, I'll skip this. So now we know, of course, there's W and Z bosons. Uh, and uh, where do I want to go with this? So roughly with the W and the Z bosons here, I'll be a little uh, cavalier. We have, you know, we have quarks instead of nucleons. We have the same um, structure. So here I'm looking at the charge current process. Uh, which do I need here? So I'm converting it down to an up quark, and I need to conserve charge. I, I need to produce a W minus or annihilate a W plus. I think that's what I need. An electron. So we have a Lagrangian that looks like this, where these are all now mass dimension four. And then, uh, okay, it's not far off from, like we could pretend this was a proton. We know this isn't correct because the proton's a composite state. But if we roughly um, pretended this was a proton, this is what the Lagrangian might look like. And if you were actually to go uh, write down this Lagrangian uh, in terms of protons and neutrons, you wouldn't quite have this. What you would have is you'd have a proton times um, GV gamma mu minus GA gamma mu gamma 5. And since I've flipped the indices, and GV, this is the vector charge of the proton which is one, it's in isospin limit, it's a protected to be exactly one. And GA is not protected by any symmetry, and this is a number that's like 1.27. And so then, how would you do the matching? So Fermi's theory would look like, I have some neutron, proton, and then I have a couple, uh, I have an electron and a neutrino. And it's just a contact operator. Whereas in the high energy theory, we would say, ah, well, what I, need, what I really have is I have some neutrino, electron connected to some W boson, a neutron, and a proton. And so then what you would do is you take this theory and require them to, to be the same. But you get to do it under this limit where this W boson propagator is <clears throat> It's probably minus I. So if Q is the momentum transfer into the W boson propagator, so here is an exact statement. Okay, this side of the board, it's a little, I think you know what I'm writing here, MW squared, it's a little, uh, the chalk isn't working perfectly over here. But the point is, what is this value Q? Well, we know the W mass is like 80 GV or something like that. Um, Q is gonna be a number of relevance to the, the, the allowed energy in the system. So the neutron proton mass splitting, I don't know if you guys, know this by heart, like I do, happens to be, at least this was the number um, a few years ago in the PDG. It's, it's a rather small number compared to 80 EV. This is MEV, so first of all, we lose three orders of magnitude, and then it's a 1.3. Um, so Q squared is gonna be on the order of this number squared, which you can see is much smaller than the W mass. So Q squared over MW squared is gonna be on the order of 10 to the minus five squared. So to a very good approximation, we can ignore this momentum aspect of the fact that the W is an actual state that's propagating along. And so if we do that and we just ignore that, well, lo and behold, that looks like a contact interaction. 
It's constant in momentum, so if you Fourier transform this, this comes back to a delta function in position space. So it looks like a contact interaction. It looks exactly like that. And so if you start from here, you can actually determine exactly what this CW coefficient is by matching the theories. Now, of course, it gets complicated because we have QCD and we have, oh, it's not really one and one, but I have this GA number, but you can see how uh, this matching occurs. So in fact, this is my first exercise for you, is to uh, take the actual standard model, and I will write down some equations, which I won't promise to be absolutely true. So I trust that you will go find the mistakes I'm writing, and actually do the matching, and figure out what G Fermi is. <clears throat> So we'll use muon decay, where we don't have to worry about uh, the, the, this composite nature. So our Lagrangian will be, we'll have a W plus going to a J mu plus W minus. Ah. And then there's also a... Um, current for the Z boson. So this J mu plus minus is going to be given by J1. Notice the flip in the sign, minus plus J2. Um, J mu of isospin A is these are the Poly matrices. In the convention you're used to from quantum mechanics, our Z current is a little different. I mean, I don't even need to write down the Z because we're going to do the charge current, but just so you have it to help find any mistake I've made in normalization. We have this electric charge. We're expressing the weak charge in terms of the electric charge and the, the weak mixing angle. And then we have J mu 3 coming from this equation, if I were to put in a tau 3, minus sine squared theta w, uh, electromagnetic current. And then the fermions are psi. We have the electron. So here, I guess I flipped the order of which is top. So this, this is where maybe I've messed up, and maybe you know this should be the other way around. I can't promise you I got this right. We don't need to worry about the tau. Uh, the quark level currents are. Don't need to worry about the top. And then these primed quark fields are given by the product of the CKM matrix element. So we have here, these are the QCD eigenstates. This is the weak eigenstate. And so then what you want to do is use the standard model Calculate mu on decay. And match it to the low energy weak Lagrangian. I'll just call it the Fermi Lagrangian, even though it's not exactly how he wrote it. Uh, and this is 
eight G Fermi over square root two. Um, And the goal is to determine G for me is what? So first you have to check that I haven't messed up some factors like disordering. Yeah. Ah, I'll give you this much of a hint. G for me is some number times one over MW squared. So in that sense, it's a constant. And exactly what this number is, is I guess the exercise. So again, you have this W boson propagator. You have to integrate out the W. In this case, what that means is get with the W boson propagator, just ignore the Q squared. You're left with this contact 1 over MW squared like effect, which is a number. But then what exactly is this number here? The electromagnetic current. Oh, you want to go? Well, we, don't, we don't really need it for this exercise. So it's just. It, This is, again, sum over, uh, sum over the quark flavors, psi bar Q uh, gamma mu psi, where Q is the electric charge operator. OK. So in the last few minutes, um, I'll just say, so what are some other examples of effective field theories that we're mostly not going to talk about just because of time? So do you guys know other, by any of you, so have you heard of heavy quark effective theory? So just some other EFTs, just so you know. There's a vast literature on the subject. There's something called heavy quark effective theory. Um, so for charm and bottom quarks, the, the mass of the quark is much, much greater than the scale of lambda QCD for Q in. It's also true for the top quark, but the top is special, so we're going to ignore it. Um, so in heavy quark effective theory, what you do is you take the approximation at leading order, the quark is infinitely massive, so it doesn't move. And then you systematically build in small kinetic recoil corrections to the heavy quark by giving it a non-relativistic kinetic energy propagator. And maybe we'll talk about a similar, depending on how fast or slow I go, we might talk about what's known as heavy baryon chiral perturbation theory, which was constructed after heavy quark effective theory. So some, a lot of the same concepts. So it works very well for the bottom quark. It works marginally well for the charm quark. Um, there's, a, there's a heavy quark spin symmetry. So I'll just use the words so you can look them up. And what is this? In order to flip the spin of a quark, you need one over the mass of the quark. Just think about you know, the magnetic moment operator of the nucleon. If you were to write it down on a Lagrangian, you'd have sigma mu nu, nucleon, antinucleon, and you'd have a one over two mass of the nucleon. So in the same way, if you want to have some dynamics that flips the quark of the spin, you need one over the quark mass. And so at the first approximation, there's a heavy quark spin symmetry. So the way the charm quark might decay will be symmetry different spins polarizations. Also, the first approximation, the dynamics of heavy quark decay, for example, if you look at a, a D meson or a B meson decaying, 
those should be the same at leading order. And then you get corrections that scale like one over the mass of the D meson or the B meson. So these little corrections you can build in a systematic way. There's something known as another one, non-relativistic QCD. <clears throat> so non-relativistic QCD starts with heavy quark effective field theory, but wants to describe Q bar Q systems like the Upsilon or the JSI. So NRQCD is uh, HQET plus being able to handle Q bar Q state. Well, let me use big Q for the heavy quark. Q bar Q states. So this, this again, it works well for bottom quarks, marginally well for charm quarks. I mentioned before the soft collinear effective theory. So what this is, is a theory that allows you to compute perturbative gluonic corrections in the collinear limit where you think QCD factorization applies. So if you have some electron you're shooting off of a nucleon and the hard photon comes and hits the nucleon, how can you rigorously compute perturbative QCD effects in these hard scattering processes where you have the ability to factorize the non-perturbative matrix element and some radiative gluon corrections? There's a chiral perturbation theory, often written chi-pt, chiral perturbation theory. So this is one we'll talk about in a little detail, just because it's a nice example that is well documented in the literature, so you can go from here and uh, dig into a little more. This is a description of low-energy QCD of mesons and nucleons. There's, from built on this, there's something called the two-nucleon effective field theory, and this can come in a pion-less and a pion-full variant. And if I'm exceptionally fast, maybe we'll talk about pionless to nuclear effective field theory, maybe not. Okay, that's another thing. I haven't planned out all the lectures yet because I want to kind of see the pace we go and it, based on questions you may or may not have, I'll like redirect exactly what I talk about towards the end. I have a plan of what I'll do, but your inquiries can push me in a different direction. And last, I mentioned quantum gravity. I won't say anything about it here, but people think they can use effective field theory methods to understand quantum gravity as a non-relativistic, or not non as a relativistic uh, effective theory for quantum gravity. And that I'll stop for today. Let's thank Andre. <laughs> Do we have questions, comments, more discussions? Don't be shy. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, in the context of statistical field theory, there are uh, irrelevant, marginal irrelevant operators uh, related to the critical coefficients they, they have when you describe them. Uh, it's the same thing based on the dimension, the, the, mass, the mass dimension because you said that the operators can be classified in irrelevant, relevant, and marginal based on the mass dimension. Is there any relation between the mass dimension and their critical exponents? So, unfortunately, I don't know. So you said you used the word Grebov coefficient, so that... No, uh, uh, critical exponents. Critical so, exponents, sorry. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna guess, guess it's very equivalent, but unfortunately, um, I don't have that in my working knowledge. But it's going to, again, going to be some separation of long distance and short distance effects. And the short distance effects will be irrelevant. So it's probably you can map it into something about the critical exponent. Thank you. You talk about the, um, the Majorana neutrino. And you talk about that in a way that's a natural extension of a standard model. 
So is something like the uh, the Higgs field uh, gives mass to neutrinos, something like that? It was pops in my mind. Uh, in it gives a mass to the neutrino, but not in the standard way, like not no, a direct not mass. Uh, dynamical uh, symmetry break in something like that. It is from the 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 Higgs fact field. that the Higgs gets a vacuum expectation value, but you know the way it gives the Dirac mass term. Uh, looks like a Yukawa coupling, right? And here we have a higher dimension operator. So this operator is not allowed in the standard model because it's mass dimension five. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, in a very similar way, you could think of it like that. Because the Higgs condenses, it gives a mass to the neutrino, but now it goes like V squared instead of like V. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, like, you can, in principle, have Dirac mass terms for neutrinos, but unlike the other leptons, you can also have the Majorana, and it's nature we don't know, which is why, and this is, uh, there's some advantages and disadvantages of, of what Andre presented, so. What I don't recall off the top of my head is if you're allowed to give a Dirac mass to the neutrino in the same way that you give it to the electron. You can. I, you you can. can. You get more. Um, I mean, with a Higgs whole with mechanism. A, yeah, you can. The, the, the thing that people don't like about it is the unnatural smallness of the Yukawa couplings um, for the neutrino masses compared to all the other uh, fermions of the standard model which is why it's like, well, that is, it's not really nice. But since neutrinos get a Majorana term, it, through some mechanisms, can actually help explain that if there is some high energy scale lambda that is like a, you know, a more, um, you know, a bigger theory that encompasses it. And that's why it's attractive, because it helps explain the natural problem, if you think it's a problem. Any other questions? So next time we might start doing some loop integrals. So dust off your dimensional regularization. <laughs> and by next time, I guess I mean tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. So we now have lunch break until uh, 2 p.m. this afternoon. We will meet back with uh, Amy Nicholson giving us her lecture. Thank you.